my name is Jeff Schaefer. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of Information Technology at Unifund in Cincinnati, Ohio. I am also the Adjunct Professor teaching Data Visualization at the University of Cincinnati. I'm a four-time Tableau Zen Master and co-author of the Big Book of Dashboards. All right, thank you, Jeff. I am Steve Wexler. I'm the founder, principal, and sole employee at Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was back in the Austro-Pithecan era. Uh, I'm a five-time Tableau Zen master, and I am, along with Jeff and Andy Cotgreave, one of the three authors of The Big Book of Dashboards. Great, and so welcome to uh, Chart Chat. Steve uh, likes to call this uh, more of a fight, I guess, uh, of opinion. But uh, you know, the uh, it's it's it is two guys duking it out, I guess. Um, we often agree more than we disagree, so uh, uh, that's what this is about. I would say that this really started as an offshoot of the discussions we had around uh, the chapters in the big book book of dashboards and wanted to bring some of that to life for you all. So for those of you who are joining us live, thank you very much. And uh, I still see some some people joining here and this will be recorded and, and put up on YouTube. Um, I guess rather than two guys duking it out, it's a little bit more like uh, the, the uh, this slide, which is uh, two older dogs arguing over a donut chart i think i think every you know every year we're getting older here and um we have a lot of experience at this and and a lot of bad donut charts i guess to talk about so i, I like this slide i think this one this one probably uh discusses a little bit more about what chart chat is all about so with that let's kick it off and uh our agenda today is to recap uh our discussion last time in chart chat around critique in data visualization. And uh, we had a little bit of uh, critique of our critique. So we were gonna discuss that today. Um, and then our main topics for today is thoughts on the Tableau Viz of the day, specifically how those are picked and some choices they make and how to avoid having the tool dictate the visualization. I wanna show you some examples of how uh, the shape of our data and the tool we use uh, often dictates the, the visualization choice. And I'm not so sure that's a, a good thing. Uh, and being aware of what our tool does to us, uh, whatever that tool might be. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we have today. Uh, we're going to cut that to about 45 minutes to allow a little bit more time for Q&A. Uh, in our past chart chats, uh, we had to cut some of the questions short. So we're going to uh, do that today and, and try to stay on schedule to, to get some more questions in from uh, our chat window. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so a quick note, we are uh, going to keep this to 45 minutes and we're going to try to open up the chat window a little bit more and try to have a little more give and take uh, throughout the presentation. So um, um, I do want to couch everything through the, the filter or the lens that I look at the data visualization world. Uh, three slides that I try to show in, in several times whenever I present a workshop. So keep this in mind. This is how I'm looking at the world. Um, who is your audience? What is the message? And for that target audience and that message, for the largest number of people provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. That, that, that's how I look at, at what I'm supposed to be doing in the data visualization space. And with that in mind, I want to look at uh, some criticism of our critique of data visualization criticism. And I heard from my good friend and colleague, Ben Jones. If you don't know who Ben Jones is and you're in the Tableau community, uh, you have no idea the indebtedness that you have to this guy. I think he joined Tableau in around 2013, and for a long time, he was one of the chief stewards of Tableau Public uh, and did an incredible job of um, creating this, this amazing community uh, around Tableau Public. And uh, I think December of last year, he went out on his own and founded a new company called Data Literacy, helping people learn the language of data. And he's doing extremely important work, and you should check it out. In any case, um, he contacted me after the last 
uh, chart chat, and he just felt that Jeff and I kind of squandered an opportunity uh, to dig in on some stuff. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into a, a blog post or an article that Ben had written, and Ben and I disagree about whether it's okay to critique in, um, in certain situations. I think, and Ben is not here to speak for himself, so at some point we should probably have him on here. Um, but if I were to, uh, what, what I heard was, how do you deliver that message? And um, people can be brutal and not realize that they're being brutal. And instead of nurturing talent, we can sometimes alienate people. So um, it got me thinking about this, about, well, how do I critique other people's work? And, and am I doing this in a, in a nurturing way that's going to bring out the best in them? Or, or am, I, uh, am I being a jerk? And, and, I, and if I were to say, you know, if, if, if I were to um, distill Ben's recommendation, it was, yeah, it's okay to critique. Just don't be an, an asshole about it. So it uh, made me think about, well, how do I critique a, someone who's new to this, an expert, and, and, and suppose a data visualization is being presented by a news organization. You know, and I think of a news organization, and I think of of the incredible fodder we have in our um, in our workshops from from Fox News. And look, you publish something like this, um, you're you're going to get reamed out for for intentionally trying to mislead people, as opposed to an innocent mistake and things like that. Um, this is this is a classic case of do not cut the axis off on a bar chart because you can't help but think that the bar on the right is, you know. Uh, you know, five, six times bigger than the bar that's on the left. But it did have me thinking about the way I've delivered criticism in the past. And I got to tell you, I, I find this chart chat is an opportunity for me to uh, confess to a lot of my sins. Um, uh, I think our first chart chat, I was kind of bummed out at, at at the way I use color in one of the dashboards that's in the book and wish I had done it a little bit differently. So I use chart chat as an opportunity to say, hey, if I were doing this differently, um, here's how I would do it now. So as I'm thinking about, well, how do I deliver this, this criticism, uh, two, three things came to mind. Uh, one was got to present at the Washington DC Tableau user group um, last, two years ago in June. Uh, Brittany Fong and, 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 and Cesar do an incredible job um, running, this, uh, running this group. It's a great Tableau user group. At the end of my presentation, a lot of people came up and you know, wanted to chat about stuff. And, and one young guy, I'm going to say mid to late 20s, he, he kind of almost accosted me. He had an open laptop and said, please look at this. And um, I was a little taken aback by it. And, and he showed me something. And this guy had great uh, design chops, by the way. And um, I didn't stop and pause and talk about all of the good things that were in the Viz. And there were a lot of them. I immediately started you know, saying everything that was wrong with it. And, um, and I think the guy kind of left a little bit deflated. And I realized, well, I'm supposed to be a good teacher and a, and, and a good mentor and a good nurturer of stuff. And I totally failed. Now, <laughs> advice to you if you want to get a critique, don't come up to somebody right after a presentation and say, please look at this thing right now. Ask if you, if you could do it, schedule time, et cetera. But in any case, whomever that person is, if, if he's out there, you did great work and have a design sense that I wish I had. Um, Sorry that I just kind of uh, glommed on to the stuff that was lacking or that I thought could be improved. Um, here's another case of something, and I'm going to um, bring up the uh, visualization in a moment. This is something that was Viz of the, got an anointed Viz of the day. Now, once something's out in public and Tableau says this is Viz of the day, I think this is kind of like fair game um, for being able to critique and, and discuss it. And, and Jeff, I know you and I don't have a disagreement about that. Give me one second and let me get the screen up. Jeff, I assume you can see this at this point? Yeah. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, Emily Lacaze had done for the Daytona Beach News Journal. And I saw, ooh, news organization. So yeah, I'm really going to go out after this. And 
it was a dual axis chart and the thesis is hey the number of firefighters over the last um 25 years 35 years have increased um significantly but the number of uh, fire related deaths has decreased significantly and is this a great way to show this and um, I took issue with it. I talked about a dual axis chart, um, uh, some of the iconography that was in there. Uh, should the axis start where the axis was starting? Different approaches. This uh, bunch of people have been discussing this on Twitter. Uh, uh, Jorge Camoes uh, from Lisbon, Portugal, had said maybe a connected scatter plot. Um, I tried doing that in Tableau and then eventually came up with the recommendation for this. And so what's wrong with the criticism that I did in there? What's, you know, this is something that, hey, it's out in the public. Tableau has anointed this viz of the day. Um, isn't this fair game? Well, four or five months after I had posted this blog, uh, Emily Lacaz contacted me and said, hey, why didn't you bring this to my attention? Either to let me defend myself or possibly improve it or address your issues. And, and I felt she was totally correct. You know, I just saw, oh, the Daytona uh, news organization didn't think about the individual as creating it, have no idea where she is in terms of her um, journey in ter uh, as being a data journalist. And I didn't give her a chance to improve it, respond or anything. She was incredibly gracious and classy. And I realized, well, I kind of felt a little bit like a jerk about this. So here, here's my opportunity to atone for my uh, sins publicly about this. And which brings me to the next uh, uh, item, which is speaking of visit the day. And Jeff and I have riffed on this a, a bit, the cost of having a, a large amplifier, meaning, gee, you have a lot of people that are paying attention to you. Either you have a lot of Twitter followers, newsletter followers, or my God, you're, you're one of the largest data visualization companies on the planet, that would be Tableau, and you're publishing stuff, people are going to listen to you. And um, my concerns and problems with uh, a visit of the day and a profile that Tableau did of the very deserving Samo Droll, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, my apologies if I've mangled it, but this guy does great work um, is data visualization and, and business analyst at, at Uber and is highly deserving of people following him. And I gave him a heads up that I was going to be talking about this stuff. Okay. And he said, Hey, by all means, go for it. And, um, let me show you the viz of the day. Let me, um, uh, uh try to find that here or the whole, um, uh, example so here was the tableau public team said wow this guy's doing some really cool work and we want to profile this now this was a makeover monday exercise um and where uh, there was a fascinating article i think almost certainly was in the new york times about uh, uh stephen curry's penchant for popcorn and he just loves popcorn and he's rated about popcorn by butter presentation crunchiness saltiness etc in um at, at the 24 uh, nba arenas and uh samo came up with this cool i originally thought it was a radar chart and jeff said no it's not really a radar it's spider chart it's more like a coxcomb but it's kind of this unique uh pentagon that's different the rings in it or the depth of it is uh, how good the score is on these uh, five criteria. And if I click here, I can see you know, the, the, hey, the da Dallas Mavericks have the best popcorn because, you know, it gets a five for butter and a five for presentation, but only a four for crunchiness. The Brooklyn Nets, you know, it's not far from where I live, you know, they've got, um, three fives and two fours and you can compare all these things and scroll down you have this pretty cool image and down at the bottom is something that says um, how to read this chart well my concern about this and and here's uh, the, the, you know some other some you know charts that are like this um here's one from amy Wu, where she's making a pedal chart showing the uh different aspects of it is 
that that's a uh, for me at least is a hard read and jeff i'm going to ask you to pipe in in a minute but i'm, I'm going to uh, show some uh, alternatives that that I, I i make the joke that i'm a professional chart looker adder um and it took a little time for me to parse and understand uh samo's chart and i'm good at parsing and understanding charts it's get, take me a, a bit of time to understand this version of it and why go to something that requires so much effort two three minutes for me to learn how to understand the chart let alone it's pretty hard to make the comparison so let, let, let me show you the original of it oh so here's the full rendering of samo's visualization here's what was published um uh the, originally again i think this is in the new york times and it's just a heat map and i can see all of these things on one screen pretty neatly and i can compare across all the five categories and then here is um i adapted a um uh something that shane fife did where this is would be i think a much easier way to interpret this that I can see everything on one screen. I don't have to scroll. I can make the comparisons. Um, and anytime there's a, a, a highlight table, um, I always think it's a great candidate for a marginal histogram. And in, in this case, that's what Shane put here. And I think it's way easier for me to get this, make the comparisons, et cetera. And I fear that people seeing something anointed vis of the day they're going to think, oh, that's that's something that I should make. Um, I'm going to comment on that a little bit. You know, my my concern about all of this is is you know what is the takeaway on looking at something like that? And Jeff, you did some spelunking as you are so good at, and um, and found this on the Tableau Public's website. And you know, you know, what does the viz of the day represent? Gallery represent. And the many different ways we use Tableau Public, I've highlighted a couple of things. We might choose a viz of the day for many different reasons. The viz might be visually stunning or include an innovative chart type. And without a doubt, what Samo has done does just that. But my fear is that, and, and I didn't even know that wording existed, Jeff, until you found it. I knew in discussions with Tableau public team members that there were a lot of criteria for this, but I didn't know that was officially posted anyplace, is that people are going to look at this and think, you should make a chart that looks like this. Oh, this is the day you should be making stuff like this. And why do I have a problem with that? Because that is not that for, you know, what is the audience? What is the message? Provide the greatest degree of understanding to, uh, with the least amount of effort. I don't think that does that. And I think with organizations and people trying to make inroads getting upper management to embrace data, data visualization i would hate to see them think hey i'm going to blow the ceo away i'm going to blow my chief operating officer away i'm going to make this wickedly cool looking i don't even know what to call the pentagon type of chart and they're going to be really blown away by how cool this is and I think you're going to make a step backwards because they're not going to understand it. They're going to say, you know what, this is not helping me. Just give me numbers. Where if you had made um, a simpler chart, and Jeff, I know you found a whole bunch of, of uh, examples of taking the same data set and taking stuff that was much simpler. Had you done a simpler chart, the person who may not have embraced data visualization would embrace data visualization because they could say oh you know what i really am seeing this much more clearly i don't think you get that with samo's chart i have no problem with samo creating that chart i think it's great he's exploring a technique and he has a design sense that totally smokes mine i hope to have the privilege of maybe working with him on a project at some point but i just don't think that was the the best way to present that data i think it was um uh squelching the information for a sense of decoration. Jeff, do you want me to pass control over to you or yeah, no, something to be uh, talking so much? No problem. Let me jump in, I guess. Um, I, I probably agree with most of that in a, in a sense. Um, I, I think I like the fact that you set this up at the beginning with who's the audience and what's the message, who the audience is important to me for that particular question that you're, you're asking, you, you're looking at his chart 
in the makeover Monday, which I guess was a New York Times remake. Um, I, I, I've actually been jumping in on the Makeover Monday project, so I, I should say I, I didn't review that week. I was I was uh, on the week before, and I'm on next week with the Makeover Monday team, um, just a, as a guest. But uh, that week, I, I guess Ava and Sarah reviewed reviewed those visas. Um, if it's a New York Times viz, I guess my assumption would be that this is a general audience. So I would assume the visualization should be read by the, the general audience. Um, from a ease of use, I think what, what, what Steve, you're outlining is the struggles of trying to compare length of something or size of something moving in different directions in different places. They don't have a common baseline in any form, makes the comparisons harder. On the same point, if I'm trying to get engagement uh, with a broader audience, I think Samo's done a great job getting engagement. It's it's a beautiful use of color. It's a beautiful use of font and grid design and you know all the things we talk about in our workshops as well. I think he's nailed a lot of those. It's just the chart type, I guess, that we're questioning here. Um, so I guess one thing that that I would show is uh, see if I can bring my screen up without going into too hard here. Let's see. Entire By the screen. way, as you're doing that, Jeff, I'm going to say that, you know that that someone with Sama's talent, he probably you know he could do both. You know that get, you know get this incredible design and, and 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 engagement and probably, in my view, you know hey it's our chart chat so we're allowed to say what we want here um uh, by the way if, if others want to pipe in on this on chat we're happy to hear from you um but i think he could say you know make something which is a, a stunning design and rock solid analytic integrity yeah so th this is along those same lines this is a, an example of where i think that might work um this is a similar design to that pedal that, that you showed, um, Amy Wu's viz, I believe, and those right. pedals are going in different directions to show these variables. Now, this is designed by Moritz Steffener. Uh, this is out, at the, it's the OECD Better Life Index, been around for a long time. He's got a great blog post on how he designed this and, and all the things that went into it. And uh, what I what I wanna point out here is, and you can do this in Tableau, uh, there's a Viz and Tooltip. Uh, you hover over any of this and you can get a precise comparison to see that community, in this case that's red, is bigger than jobs in blue. Um, or the orange one and and the uh, dark gray, they're the same size. Um, you know, something across the petal is going to be really hard trying to compare the the, the blue, for example, uh, to the purple or to the orange to the red. Um, now, this design also the the petal size. It's not just the length of the petal. Like you know, it's kind of the size of the petal because you can kind of see the blue the blue petals. You know, just a little little thinner, I guess, than the red pedal. Um, but, but as you move around, you can kind of see those exact comparisons that that may be difficult, especially with the smaller, smaller pedals are going to be really, really hard to see in this instance. Um, you know, the orange pedal or the green pedals that are that are so small at the bottom. Right. Right. Um, you just you can't make those comparisons and they're kind of getting dwarfed. Um, and this is interactive, too. So if housing means more to you and uh, and community means more to you and uh, health means more to you, you can you can interact with this viz and the pedals rearrange and they resize and then you can go have a look into that data. So. I think what Moritz did really well here is gave an accommodation, you know, similar to what we do with, you know, a, a, a colorblind friendly viz um, or something like uh, uh, size. You know, you can make an accommodation for where size, we're not really good at judging the size of something. This is a really good accommodation in this instance where if you need a precise comparison, you can get it. Uh, but you don't lose the visual, uh, I guess, attractiveness, uh, engagement um, that I think you get from a viz like this. Hey, Jeff, um, really great uh, uh, explanation of what's going on here. The, the two things, and then we've got comments from Chris Love and Lynn that I want to pipe uh, amplify. But one thing here also is I, the overall Better Life Index. I can easily compare them by height. Yeah. because there's a common baseline in the overall height of this thing versus and and i've kind of slated this to be our end discussion beginning of the next thing i have a, a 
problem with small multiples. Um, if you look at um, Samo's uh, example, how do I compare the thing in the upper left-hand corner with that thing in the bottom right-hand corner easily? And we'll, we'll get into a discussion of this a little bit later. So that, that, that and, and sometimes, look, I've got a hundred things to compare. I can't just make it this sprawling thing that goes from top to bottom. Maybe I need to make it a 10 by 10 type of thing. Like Chris Love did this, uh, um, this population pyramid alternative of all these different countries and he did it as a small multiples and maybe oh i want to now compare this country with this other country and i'll select those two and then maybe i'll have a, a better side by side comparison so part part of what i like so much about this example here is because it isn't small multiples and there's a common baseline i can get a sense of just how much taller luxembourg um uh, is the Mexico. Um, Chris has a couple of comments, if I might interject. Isn't this a problem of picking a chart isolated from its audience? Samo didn't specify his audience and sending it to a wide audience on Visit the Day. I'd love Visit the Day and Visits in general to state their intended audience so we can understand the viewpoint for which they were created. That's a really good point. And Jeff, I think you mentioned that to me yesterday, wishing that when Visit the Day indicate why it was chosen as biz of the day. So, oh, this is not a best practice for general business use. Here's why we're including it. And um, uh, and Lynn is saying, I think the uh, OECD viz is impossible to cipher and it's exactly the problem with encouraging the viz of the day to represent charts that we sh um, should mimic in, uh, in, instead of them being seen as art as they truly are. Um, Lynn, now that you know Jeff has kind of explained this thing and and how to interpret it, it's it's just a question of um, how much explanation do you have in it. So I think this works both as art and I think it also has a, a fair amount of uh, analytic integrity in it as well. I'm not suggesting that Samo doesn't have analytic integrity. Let me change that. <laughs> great analytic integrity. It's playing into stuff that humans do well, comparing the, comparing the length of things from a common baseline. And that's happening uh, in, in the um, uh, quality of life index. And it's hard, much harder to do in Samo's viz. Yeah, I guess I, I agree with Lynn that the OECD to make precise comparisons, it is it is difficult. It's just as difficult as Amy's Viz or Samo's Viz. I, I guess the thing I was pointing out in that particular one, uh, and one that you pointed out, it, it is set up as a bar chart, so you do get a precise comparison of the overall countries, and as you saw, you could rank them. Um, but what I really liked about that was the tooltip, because you know it was. To me, it was as if more it's saying, you know, hey, I know you're going to have a hard time reading this. I'm going to give you a tooltip that you can hover over and, you know, you can make that precise comparison between each pedal if you if you really need to. Um, and if that were a different design, I, I don't know, you know, for their website, this is a, a general audience. It was a graphic that they used even there. If you look up here on the little favicon on there on the browser, uh, of the OECD. Let me, let me see not, if I can yeah, share my, yeah. my screen again and, and, and show you that. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but let me, it's so small. Um, but if I can share my entire screen here, there's a little favicon up by the words OECD better life index. And, you know, even their, their, their logo, I mean, they've, they've really adapted this into an artful design, uh, of what they're, what they're trying to get at. At. So clearly there's an art to this, um, you know, that's, that's the whole purpose of this, this website, I guess, um, is to, is to get that engagement. Um, so I think he did, you know, I think he did a great job on that. So Jeff, as we transition to our next item, which is not letting the tool dictate, um, uh, the, the, the visualization. I just want to step back for a second, and, and I don't want this to come out as, "Hey, I'm sniping at Tableau Public." Um, anyone who's followed my blog knows I'm I'm you know, think a huge reason for the success in the of Tableau and and progress in the data visualization community is because of this amazing free platform. My concerns are around how some people may interpret Viz of the day. And that, oh, I was all set to create this bar chart, but you know, I think I'm going to do this other thing instead. And 
possibly squandering an opportunity to to get get clarity in an organization because they got kind of excited about uh, a novel uh, chart type as in the chart type that's here. So I hope we see a little more maybe in Tableau Public with why was this chosen and uh, what the takeaway should be from it. And I'm curious if any any of the participants we have here uh, joining us today have any thoughts on this as well. I think tags would work really well. Tagging something, you know, innovative chart type or or a description of of maybe more in the mindset of why they picked it. Uh, this is a new author, you know. Maybe it's the first Tableau public viz that they published. You know, we've seen some visualizations. You you, you know, one day you'll see this. Uh, uh, this mathematically curvy, you know, crazy chart type. And the next day you'll see something very basic uh, and, and very simple to do. And so understanding maybe the mindset of why, why it was picked, I think would, would maybe help the community in that case. Yeah, the, there, there were probably six or seven, by the way, this particular data set, there were a, a, a bunch of things that I thought, you know, I showed the one from Shane Five or the slightly modified one from Shane, but there were a bunch that just use um, bars, use dots, um, along a common baseline. And, and for me, it was easier for me to compare the San Antonio Spurs with the Dallas Mavericks, that, that type of thing. And gee, why I'm probably not going to go out of my way to order popcorn um, uh, if I see a Cleveland Cavaliers game in Cleveland. Um, so uh, with that, Jeff, any other thoughts or shall we move to our, our next item? Uh, I think we can move to the, the next one. Samo actually uh, responded with some uh, words on his viz. Oh, by the way, if the goal of viz of the day is to start a conversation, they certainly succeeded. <laughs> um, um, uh, Sam, uh, so Samo says, I agree with most of Steve's feedback regarding simplicity and readability. Regarding my viz, I wanted to make something different than efficient heat map and challenge myself totally cool and I get that in my visits impossible to compare the first and the last and the viz might be best in print version where you can get the whole picture I love that viz as a poster you know it could be a beautiful thing to have up and and, and or it's in the poster that's in the lobby of of um, you know uh, some the Dallas Fortune Mavericks. 500 company of uh, the Dallas. Well, uh, yes, definitely the Dallas Mavericks, or maybe the Brooklyn Nets. Not so yeah. much some of the teams that are down at the bottom. Um, so, Samo, thanks for joining us today, and thanks for 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 piping in on this stuff. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more great stuff from you. Yeah, that's going to get to the heart of where Steve and I are going to disagree on small multiples. I think, you know, Samo brings up a point where, you know, if something's in print or something in static form. Uh, that's where I think, you know, small multiples can uh, can can do really well. So great, great point. So and, uh, Adrian Hernandez writes, a visitor are like statistics without context. They can be misleading. Context, they can be misleading. Proper context is needed so users are aware of exactly uh, what the data means. Creating visualizations is part art, part science, and not easy to accomplish the correct balance. Yeah, that's kind of, um, Jeff and I are, are, and I think everyone in this field are constantly uh, um, uh, trying to find that that right balance. But keeping the who is the audience and what is the message uh, in mind, and my audience are usually business users, so I'm usually going for simplicity. All right, we need to transition. Jeff, so why don't you take us? Sure. This next one, I'm going to move out of uh, slides for a little bit and just uh, talk about some some data here. So give me one second. I'm on a I'm in a hotel room, so I apologize for the infinite screens here. I don't have a choice in that instance. So I want to talk about how your data set can drive um, your visualization choices. So th this is a data set I use in my data visualization class. It's published on my blog. I made it I made it a public data set a number of years ago, four or five years ago, and I've been using it in my class ever since 2011 or 12 uh, when I started teaching data visualization. And so every class I've had has visualized this data set in some form. And what this data set is, it's, it's very simple. It's just a count of my trick-or-treaters at Halloween. 
uh, on October 31st. Uh, every year it's October 31st in this data set. And I've tracked it since 2008, all the way, I have updated data all the way to, to 2018. And I've kept that data mostly year to year in, in half hour increments. So I literally, I have a counter, I clicker and I click and, and count. Usually I have people to, to help me. Um, so somebody is usually counting uh, for me while I'm passing out the candy to make sure I get an accurate count. And I've been tracking this data ever since. And a lot of people have done some fun things with this, this data set. Um, now these are cumulative numbers. So on the right hand side, you see a total amount of trick or treaters. And so, yes, I've had a high of 869 trick or treaters at, at come to my house. What I wanted to talk about is how the tool that we use can sometimes drive the way that we visualize data. And, and, and I guess the exception is maybe a, a coding language, like maybe that isn't the case with something like R or Python or D3, uh, where you're coding a visualization from scratch. Although I guess even in those cases, you might be using some sample code uh, to get you there. This is more about the tool though. Um, tools, visualization tools, let's start with something like Excel. Uh, when you plot this into Excel, you get a lot of charts that start to look the same. So in the uh, seven years or whatever I've been teaching this class, um, when I first started this assignment, the very first assignment, pretty much everybody would do it in Excel. Um, nowadays, that's kind of shifted to, to Tableau. But um, back in the early days, a lot of people used Excel. And so what you would see, and, and these aren't students who are cheating, This is these are students who are doing this assignment independently, um, but they, they click a couple buttons in Excel and they almost always end up with the same chart. And so um, they may change the markers, they may change the color a little bit away from the defaults. Um, they may do something different. Um, in, in all cases, they, they don't generally, and, and keep in mind, this is their first assignment, you know, that they created way back, but, you know, then and, and, and before they had any lectures in data visualization. So um, one thing you'll see a lot is that they'll use Excel defaults. Like they'll use the Excel default line chart. They'll get the Excel default colors. These are the blue and the red and the green and the purple you'll see over and over again um, because those those are were the Excel default colors. Um, the, the grid lines will often be defaulted. And so person after person will almost create the same chart to visualize that data. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that they're all the default color. Um, they, they may change the color. You know, in this case, somebody went in and removed some of the la labels and, you know, changed the color. I said, you know, there's a little bit of a sigh of relief after seeing the same Excel colors over and over and over and over again. Um, so how, do, how does this happen, I guess? If I, if I go over to Excel, this is the data. Excel likes cross tabs. And, you know, this is a cross tab of, you know, year versus versus time. Now, one thing that's interesting is, is to understand about your tool is that just by having the word year here, I will confuse Excel. It won't understand that this is a cross tab. It'll actually think that, that column A is a column of data labeled year, where column B is a, a data labeled with you know 6, 6 p.m. And so if I highlight this data and go to insert and just pick a line chart, just any line chart, um, you'll see the year comes across as a blue flat line as as a piece of data. It just it just happens, you know, automatically um, just just by the fact that that is there. If I took year out of my data here and had a true cross tab and did the exact same thing in Excel, well, Excel is going to do something different. It's going to it's going to treat it differently. It's not going to have year as uh, as a series in this case. It's going to have year across the x axis. Now. <clears throat> Here's another interesting thing, because I didn't put it in a date format, because it doesn't recognize that as a date, it's just going in, in order of the data, my, my time series is going backwards. And so it's actually going from 2017 to 2008, just simply because of the way my data is ordered. So another thing that just Excel is doing automatically to me. Now, if I flip this around and uh, just go to the select data option, I'm just going to flip the axis here, the, the rows and columns, just like I would in, in Tableau. Um, and, and there's that cumulative chart that everybody creates. And so 
and you can even see some of the Excel default colors. I mean, they're a little different now in newer versions of Excel, but you still see the first one is blue, red, green, purple, the first series being 17 and then 16 and 15 and 14 going backwards again. Um, it's using those default colors that Excel just likes to pick and, and likes to use. Now, jumping over to Tableau, if I have that same data, Tableau is going to recognize my date or date time fields as, as a date field. And uh, when I put that on the columns and I put the count on the rows, uh, I'm going to get a line chart. Uh, if I use my automatic marks over here, Tableau is going to try to figure out what chart type I should use. And when I'm using a date and I'm using a count, uh, it automatically shows a line chart. Now that doesn't mean I can't change it. I guess, you know, I could have changed it in Excel too. I could change it to a bar. I could change it to a dot. There certainly gives you the flexibility to change these. Um, but I guess more importantly is just the defaults that are happening out of the gate. Um, some good defaults, some not so good defaults, especially in Excel, we have some bad categorical colors that are happening. We have some, uh, some, some strange orders of our dates that are happening because it wasn't recognized as a date. Um, in this case, in Tableau, Tableau does recognize it as a date, but because of that, it automatically plots a, a line chart for us. Um, so I'll open it up there, just, just kind of interesting discussions that I think our tool, if we don't think about what we can do with our tool as a canvas, um, we all we kind of get forced into design decisions that maybe we shouldn't be forced into. Well, Jeff, you bring up a good point, and and I want to uh, comment from a friend and colleague of mine, uh, a gentleman named Andrew Kim. He's an Altrix Ace and is one of the brain trusts at a, a, a Data Meaning, and he was attending. Um, uh, the Big Book of Dashboards workshop in Orlando, and we were engaged in the dashboard exercise that you had concocted, where everybody's sketching stuff. There's no, you don't need to use a computer. You're, it's post-it notes and, and pen and paper. And a lot of people, and Andrew commented on this, found it somewhat freeing. You know that 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 they weren't channeled into a particular viz, but they were thinking, well, how would I show this particular item? and drawing it. Now, I tend to use Tableau as my drawing canvas, but that may just be, you know, complete familiarity with, with how to use it and how to, oh, I'm gonna go for this color pen and, um, oh, this, this thickness brush, that type of thing, using, using various metaphors. But um, I'm wondering how many, if, about you, Jeff, and also how many people out there like to sketch, um, the dashboard or the individual charts first before using the tool to create them. Now, how, how much do people do that and do they find it worthwhile? I, I've done both. I'll jump in and, and see if anybody comments on that. But uh, I, I do find that I, I do sketch. Um, I came for me, I, I would say I started doing that more out of the Dear Data project when I was doing 52 weeks of postcards back and forth with Andy Kreeble and uh, you know, you have this small postcard, you have this really small form factor, you have a limited use of color, you know, talk about font. I mean, font is your handwriting, right? So, you know, you have, you're, you're just limited in so many things, but yet it's so freeing because you have this blank piece of paper in front of you. So I think it, it, it created um, a, a better flexibility for my tool where I now look at Tableau as a canvas rather than a uh, insert chart tool like, like Excel is really built for. Um, now, on the flip side, what I find great about a tool like Tableau, and again, I'm a, I'm a Tableau guy, um, exploratory data analysis, right? Being able to pump in data and find trends quickly. You're not going to do that sketching, right? You're not going to, you get, you get design ideas from sketching, but you'll not find patterns or trends or stories in your data from just sitting there sketching on a piece of paper. So for me, bringing the data in, moving the data, calculating the data, you know, doing, doing some um, sort of inspecting of it. Uh, you can kind of massage and tease stories out of the data and a, and a tool like Tableau, that's, that's what that's brilliant for, right? You can, you can move things around really, really quickly and see all kinds of things in the data. Yeah, you know, we can get into a discussion of Tableau's algorithms and the, uh, um, the automatic uh, mark types and uh, people 
thing. Gosh, I've got all these bar charts. This is boring. Let me click the show me button and experiment with stuff and see what it comes up with. And and people not really recognizing the show me button is just a a, a, a pill, automated pill, push it around to different parts and then change the mark type uh, type of thing. But um, we've got like, oh, you know, we're right at 11.45 at this time, which is when we wanted to end. If there are people who have any uh, questions or comments on this, just curious, how many people sketch freehand? If you're uh, able to type into chat and let us know, that would be great. Um, and uh, thoughts for next time around, Jeff, you, you and I maybe will have a discussion of small multiples. Uh, Sam O'Droll and uh, Michael Perillo are saying they definitely sketch. Hey, Mike, great to see you. Um, Chris, uh, 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 Marianne Winifred. So it, it's, it's, I'm now a little more open to this. I think, by the way, you know, one of my favorite data visualization specialists is Kelly Martin. Um, and she says she never sketches. She just kind of uses Tableau as, as, her, uh, um, as her canvas. But I've started to sketch more. Um, Interesting. We're getting more sketchers than not, but we will look into. There we go, man. <laughs> Sketching a sand key. How about that? Whoa! Or, hey, you know. we had. Uh, I had somebody render a ridiculously accurate map of the United States um, uh, at, as a sketch, and, did, <laughs> and 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 just went, "Oh my God! You have wicked, wicked." capabilities and she confessed and said well actually she just traced it from the book but uh, <laughs> uh um hey uh, i do want to leave with one thing um just this um uh, uh um cool little wow i never would have thought of that and jeff maybe it's occurred to you and others but these are things that people have done uh to try to get people to embrace change in their organization and we were talking about dashboards with dark backgrounds in 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 the workshop um and in fact let me share my screen because i'll talk about uh um um where people can go for more resources and the like um, um which we will get to in a minute but the um while you're pulling that up, I, I guess yeah. one thought on sketching I have is when when you're collaborating, um, I, I don't find Tableau to be a great tool for collaborating. Um, I know they're working on things to be able to do that, but I, I, I encounter that as a, as a weakness, I guess, and not just Tableau. I mean, Excel's not very good at it either, but there, there's not a lot of online platforms where, you know, you could build a viz together, right? Uh, right. So you have to pass workbooks back and forth or, or something like that. Um, so WebEx, you know, you can kind of get people together, but then one person is driving. I brought everybody in a conference room and, you know, one person is then driving on the computer and the rest are kind of talking um, where sketching can can really open up collaborations. So whiteboard sketching, uh, we have yeah. know, giant whiteboards in, in the analytics area outside my office and, and we have, you know, a, a, a uh, paper, you know, sketching in a group on a conference table, those, those certainly would help with collaborating. So it might be another another way to use sketching as a tool. So th th this is, I got derailed for a moment. So here was this, uh, there was a discussion of dark background dashboards and I won't get into, but th this person, they started adopting a dark background dashboard because, not because it looked cooler, better contrast, um, the culture it was to get people to stop printing dashboards and start interacting with them live that's why they started doing the dark background dashboards if they because it's, you know, because accounting was going to ream everybody out for printing these things out and wasting all this toner and all this ink and that's why they did it and that was the first i had heard of an organization making that effort and saying okay here's how we're going to wean people from printing these things out so I wanted to share that as a little, oh, that's a pretty clever manipulation <laughs> of humans um, uh, uh, out there. So, um, hey, resources and workshops, 14 of the dashboards featured in the Big Book of Dashboards are at uh, bigbookofdashboards.com. All the recordings of chart chat can be found there. there uh, Jeff's going to post these things to YouTube. And we have some public workshops coming up in September and October, one in Washington, 
D.C. and Atlanta. I hope some of you will be able to join us there. And uh, Jeff, I think we're looking at June 11th for the next chart chat. June 11th. All right, we'll have a link for that shortly. Hey, folks, for joining us and your and contributing in chat, um, thank you much. Uh, you, uh, I think made this a lively and more enjoyable chart chat, at least for me. And isn't that what counts? Somebody asked when you're coming back to Orlando, Florida. Um, if if I do this intelligently, it will be in January, February, or March of, <laughs> of, of, of next year. Uh, August looks pretty uh, unlikely. Um, uh, so, um, you know, as though you do have one of the finest humidity festivals on the planet, along with Houston and New Orleans. Um, so uh, hope to make it there sometime next year. Hey, thanks all so much, Jeff. Always a pleasure. And um, hope to see a lot of you on June 11th. We'll have the link soon. And Samo, thank you. Thanks for the great work and um, uh, the riffing back and forth. Thank you, everyone.